We're in 1 John chapter 5 today. We'll be covering one whole verse, uh, but it's a whopper. Highly disputed and debated over, so we're going to take our time and be thorough. I have a lot of notes to get through as well, so we're just going to jump right in. 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. I remember being asked about this verse months and months ago, and the answer I gave, I could tell, was not satisfactory. You can't give an answer to this verse in, in the 15 seconds that I did in the parking lot. So we're going to take our time with it. 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make request for this. Let's ask the Lord for favor. Father, thank you for your word. The lamp unto our feet. Thank you for giving your people direction. Clear direction, not, not skewed and mystical, Lord. You clearly have disseminated what you want your people to do, how you want us to live. Laws to govern our lives. So we thank you for, for being clear, not leaving us to figure it out. So we ask now, Lord, that by your Spirit, we understand the direction you give and that we adhere to it. We want to apply it, Lord, to have the Holy Spirit apply it to our hearts and just submit. We love you. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for your son. It's in his name that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's look at the first half of verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. The Apostle John has led us from confidence in our eternal life to confidence in effectual prayer, according to the will of God, and now effectual and accessory prayer for a brother. Uh, many occasions can prompt a believer's intercession for another brother. Far too often, it gets set aside until disaster strikes, until some sort of physical ailment or calamity. 1 John 4.21 And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. That brotherly love within the camp of God is manifested by action. In James 2, 15 through 16, says, If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to him, Go in peace, be warm and be filled, and yet do not give him what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Aid of physical nourishment is only a fraction of the charge given to love a brother. For the body of Christ to see a brother in sin and fail to make petition for forgiveness and repentance on their behalf would make us equally as guilty as denying a starving brother bread. John gives directives and with our directive comes guidelines and parameters. So we're just going to take a look to stay within the parameters of those guidelines. And we're going to stick as closely uh, to context as possible, going line by line, word by word. It might be tedious, but we don't want our uh, interpretation to go wider than what was intended by the Apostle John. We don't want to get carried away. So does that sound good? Reasonable? All right. 
Firstly, our verse opens with the word if. Uh, the if is, proposes a hypothetical situation that can actually happen. And I like that it says, if anyone. This means that any member of the body of Christ is called to partake in this act. Not, not just the pastor or leadership, but even a child. Uh, perhaps that they could witness their parent sin, and then they have the opportunity to intercede on behalf of the parent. What a, what a beautiful picture of the equality of God's people before him. If anyone sees to take heed, to look upon, is visible if anyone bears witness. So this also is in that we just have a suspicion. I got a funny feeling about this brother over here, but we witnessed it and we can testify having seen the brother committing sin. Next, John is speaking about the witness of a brother. How someone chooses to interpret brother here also will determine the, the overall understanding of the verse. Some say that the term brother here is, is used loosely, not necessarily a Christian, but a brother, uh, simply a fellow man. However, no indicators are given to suggest the referred to brother is not a member of the church, but rather consistent with the sum of John's letter points to the fact that this is being a fellow believer spoken of. So now we have, all right, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin. In the original Greek, it's actually written, sinning a sin, uh, only appearing here in the New Testament. It's an interesting phraseology. It's marking the outward and the inward nature of the act. The sin that has manifested and has been witnessed is labeled as a sin not leading to death. And no doubt, we all have the same thought in our head. What is the sin not leading to death? We can't know of the sin without knowing of the death. Uh, is the, the death that John speaks of spiritual or physical? It's an important question. Many believe that John speaks of a physical death. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to physical death. We would like to think that some sins are more grievous than others. That some don't bring or deserve death as quickly as others. We don't really find that in scripture though. For example, we have Matthew uh, 26 verse 52, where Jesus said, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Live a, a violent life, taking lives. The result is your life will be taken, death. But then you have Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Not honoring your parents. We want to think that's not as severe as murder. Yet, the result is they both can yield death. All throughout Scripture, we see that all sin results in death. And we aren't the arbiters over the various sins to pass our opinion and say, well, that sin's not as likely to result in death as this sin over here. James 1.5, speaking of all sin, tells us, then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Romans 7.9, I once was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. Romans 7.5, for while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. Sin produces death. And if we read this verse and try to identify a singular sin that doesn't result in death, we're not going to find one. 
It doesn't exist. That's why John didn't identify one for us as an example. Instead, further information on this sin is found in what's said about it. That it's not leading to death. Leading or uh, leading into moving in the direction of death. Rather than one specific sin, what we have here is more likely a qualitative sin, a kind of sin. Sin that is committed while moving in a particular direction. In this case, it's either eternal life or eternal death. It's not that one sin is permissible because it's committed on the path leading to heaven. Or that partiality is shown because the sin was committed at a particular point in someone's sanctification. Nor does God show partiality to who it is that commits the sin. A brother is pursuing God with his life, progressing in sanctification, and along the way while being led into eternal life, he momentarily engages in sin, detouring from his general purpose. The result of that sin doesn't lead him to death. That's what we call in Christendom a stumble. It's not a kind of sin that speaks to their identity or the, the overall direction of their life, which is their heavenly destination to spend eternity with Jesus. But nonetheless, they stumble in their pursuit of God the same way that all of us in this room stumble. 1 John 1, 1.8, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. The sin that we all have committed not one in the same, even within this room, various sins among us. They haven't barred us from the kingdom because when we stumble in sin, we repent. And that's what determines whether the sin is a sin leading to death or not, whether it's a sin that's followed by repentance. Acts 3.19, Therefore, repent and return that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Regardless of what sin it is, for someone who is born again, born of the Spirit, who bears fruit, obeys God's commandments, and loves the brethren, the only type of sin they commit is sin not leading to death. Because any sin they commit, no matter how big, no matter how small, they don't tolerate it. They keep with repentance continually turning away from their sin and turning back towards God. If one man is on a path to, to hell and one's on a path to heaven and they both commit the same sin of an outburst of anger, well, the man leading to hell, that's business as usual. Doesn't think twice about it, just continues on the way. The one on the, on the path to heaven to be with the Lord, he turns from the path, commits sin, but he turns back again. He repents to continue on. That sin didn't lead him to death because he repented of it, and his des destination continues to be eternal life with Jesus. It didn't lead him to death. That makes sense? Let's read the next part of our verse. If anyone sees this brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, it, God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. Okay, now we have our directive for intercession. We observe a brother's sin. We then ask, and God will for the brother who stumbled Give life. Well, what a heavenly response to, to intercede. And that response coming out of us is only interposed by the love of God. More often, if we aren't careful, we can have the spirit of Cain. Am I my brother's keeper? He can stand, he can fall by the decisions he makes. Let a man be the sum of his decisions. What an evil disposition. 
that I'm 100% guilty of. We all are at times. We're all tempted when, when we're seemingly doing well in our walk and to see a brother stumble and just wag the finger at him. Or we can ask the dumbest question a Christian can ask. How could he do that? Yike. 1 Corinthians 10. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. Buddy, that flavor of sin that he committed, that's right up your alley. That's a common flavor. But because God is faithful, he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Only by God's grace am I not in my brother's shoes, stumbling in that very same sin. Looking through the lens of mercy and not pharisaical spectacles, we can see a beautiful moment to mimic our Savior and intercede for a brother in need. Hebrews 2, 17 through 18, speaking of Jesus. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted and that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aids of those who are tempted. Hebrews 7, 23 through 26. The former priests on the one hand existed Greater, in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Jesus lives to make intercession for the saints. Jesus, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. If anyone's in position to wag the finger, it's Jesus. But he doesn't. Even with his perfect vantage point, where he can see all the filth of my iniquity, his response isn't, you, you dirtbag, how could you do that? I didn't save you for that. He advocates for me. And we're given the same privilege as Jesus is our advocate with the Father. We can be our brother's advocate here on earth. Petitioning the Lord. God, please pick him up. Make him stand. He has faith in your son. Romans 14, 4. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master, he stands or he falls and he will stand because the Lord is able to make him stand. We're to ask God, maintain their faith in your son. Tether them to it. Shackle them to their eternal life that they have in Jesus. And John says, God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. And we can effectually participate in God's rescue of his fallen sheep. He can rescue and deliver all of his children apart from us, but, but he doesn't. He commissions us to pray and he uses our prayers. My prayers are useful to God Almighty. That's amazing. Revelation chapter 8, it describes an interesting scene in heaven. John describes it. It says, Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer and much incense was given to him so that he might add it 
to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Our prayers, apart from effectually working in the restoration of a brother, their incense in God's throne room. That's pretty cool. I don't know if they get recycled or what, uh, but, but our prayers have these immeasurable eternal effects. There's the benefit of the stumbling brother. We can't ascribe value to, to repentance. The, the turnaround time and getting a brother back on track and back in the fight. I'm, I'm eternally grateful for whoever it was that went to bat for me before God when I stumbled. There's benefit for ourselves because we get to obey and walk in the example set forth by our great high priest to live like Jesus. It's tough to live like Jesus in this world. Interceding for a stumbling brother, that's a home run. That's a softball in terms of obeying a command from Christ. And then eventually, their incense providing sweet aroma before God's throne. That's wild. I nerd out every time I think about it. Let's move on. The rest of verse 16. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make request for this. Got a few important things to note. If we properly note them, it'll limit our room for speculation. And that's what we want to do. We want to hone in. We don't want to widely interpret. And we can do this mainly by taking away what we don't know about this verse. John does not identify the individual as a brother. Nor does John provide his readers with the identity of the sin that is referenced. With regard to this person and this sin... John doesn't altogether prohibit prayer for them. So half the battle in understanding this verse, again, is in identifying the kind of death spoken of, much like how what we did in the first half, a sin not leading to death. Some view what John is saying as a sin unto death being a sin so serious that God judges swiftly in bringing a sudden death. And we can see those instances in the New Testament in the case of what happened in the book of Acts, chapter 5. At this time in the early church, everyone was selling off all their possessions and they were engaging in communal living. Chapter 5. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, laid it at the apostles' feet. Now remember, the issue wasn't that they kept back a portion, it was that they lied about it. They were making it known that we we're giving everything. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold... Was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard of it. And the same happened to his wife when, when she showed up. Also, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 of people who were irreverently partaking of communion. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. 
Sleep, of course, is referring to the death of a believer. God can, if he so chooses, decide it's best for this person to be brought home. Perhaps they're in danger of blowing their witness, causing a young one to stumble, unworthily partake in communion. Whatever the case, God deems that it's best that they come be with me. If the Apostle John had this in mind, a sin of a brother causing a sudden physical death as judgment of God, he didn't outright condemn prayer for them. If we can pray for someone who committed a sin that caused physical death, John would then be permitting prayer for the dead, which the Bible clearly does not condone anywhere. More likely, the death spoken of here is a spiritual death, the kind of death that John has only spoken of thus far. In the same way he's been constantly speaking of life, referring to eternal life. Hebert said this, In the New Testament, this is a really good one, everyone tune in. In the New Testament, death, whether used of physical or spiritual death, denotes a separation which is viewed as a penal consequence of sin. Sin produces separation. In physical death, the result is the separation of a man's non-material being from his physical body. In spiritual death, the soul is separated from God. In eternal death, the human being is banished from the presence of God. And it seems clear that death here refers to a spiritual death rather than a physical condition, i.e. separation from the life which is only available in Christ, end quote. Now, accepting that John is speaking with reference to a spiritual eternal death, that still leaves us with the question, what is the sin? What is the sin that leads to death? This isn't the first mention of sin. It's just the first mention of unidentified sin. John has been more than thorough in identifying sin to his readers. And John assumes that the observant believer will be able to distinguish not the sin, but the type of sin. Such sin as rejection of belief in Jesus as Messiah and Son of God, unwillingness to obey God and pursue holiness, and failure to love fellow believers. Therefore, whether the sin is followed by repentance or practice determines whether the sin is leading to death or not. 1 John 3.7 Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. It's a sin deliberately persisted in until it culminates in death. John doesn't identify a sin because we, the brethren, identify the sin mark by, marked by unrepentance. All unrepentant sin leads to death, no matter what the, sin, what the sin is. It will bring them to their destination, whether they're pedaling on a bike or taking a 747. You pedal on the bike long enough, you'll trade up for bigger and better sins. One commentator said this, Therefore, John is not describing a sin that can be committed accidentally or even in a moment. Yet all sin is gradual, no one reaches full degradation overnight. Rather, every sin paves the way for deeper and greater sin. End quote. Hebrews 3, 12 through 13. Take care, brethren, that there not be any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another. Day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Which brings us to our final portion of verse 16, where John tells us, 
about those who commit sin leading to death, I do not say that he should make request for this. Again, context is our friend. 1 John is a fantastic one-sit read, the whole book, if you got a free afternoon. I can't think of a better book to just burn through than 1 John. The context of chapter 5 leading up to this statement tells us, belief in Jesus, obedience to God's commandments, assurance of salvation. That confidence is then carried into the throne room. And verse 14 says, this is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Then we're told to intercede on behalf of a fellow believer who has stumbled, who has sinned, someone who pursues God and desires communion with the Lord. They sin, so we pray for their reconciliation and continued fellowship with God. That's praying in accordance with God's will. Not just his desire, but his unstoppable will that will come to pass. The sun running its course, the moon and the stars shining at night. God's desire is for all men to repent. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but for all to come to repentance. That's not his decreative will. His unstoppable will that causes the sun to shine and the moon and the stars at night. It, it's his desire for, for men to repent. And if it's also the desire of the man who commits the sin to repent. Our verse tells us, pray for that man. And God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. That man will continue to have life in Jesus. Romans 10, 9 through 13. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on Him. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. As much as the sun runs its course and the moon and stars shine at night, God decrees His unstoppable will of salvation upon that man, that man will be saved. Because that man is willing to repent and be saved. Now, we have a man who practices sin, who has no desire to repent, and that sin is leading him to death. And John says, I do not say that he should make requests for this. There's an interesting time spoken of the people of Judah in the book of Jeremiah, and that's where we're going to go now. Go ahead and flip in your Bibles. To the book of Jerry, it's uh, right next to Isaiah, right in the middle, big book, you're not going to miss it. Right after Isaiah. Jeremiah chapter 7. It was a word for Jeremiah and the people of Judah, but, but God's attitude towards sin and his willingness to save remains the same. Jeremiah 7, 16 through 19, starting at verse 16. As for you, do not pray for this people and do not lift up a cry or prayer for them and do not intercede with me, for I do not hear you. Do you not see what they are doing in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and their, fi their fathers kindle the fire. And the women knead dough and make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods in order to spite me. Do they spite me, declares the Lord? Is it not themselves they spite to their own shame? 
So there was a time, for Jeremiah at least, where God said, don't pray to me about them anymore. I'm not hearing you intercede for them. Look at what they're doing. They, they know what they're doing is wrong. They know what they're doing upsets me and they continue to do it anyway. Flip to the right, a couple pages of chapter 11. Chapter 11, verses 14 through 15. Verse 14. Therefore, do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them. I will not listen when they call to me because of their disaster. What right has my beloved in my house when she has done many vile deeds? Can the sacrificial flesh take away from your disaster so that you can rejoice? So now God's telling Jeremiah, don't pray to me for these people when they cry. They should be weeping over their sin, not the damage their sin has brought them. And he tells Jeremiah, sacrifice won't bring them into fellowship with God. Sacrifice won't cause these people to have a penitent heart. And I think that's close to what the heart of John is telling us regarding our prayer for the unrepentant individual committing sin leading to death. If they don't repent, no amount of sacrifice of time and prayer or tears we can cry to the Lord is going to produce repentance that needs to take place in their own heart. God isn't standing at the ready to supernaturally impose His will by His divine power to force people into repentance. The prophet Jeremiah would be out of the job. If God is willing to stop man's rebellious living sooner than they themselves make their own decision to repent. I would be mad at God if he could have gotten a hold of me sooner than he did. Or if he was waiting for a certain person to pray a certain prayer. God was waiting on me and me alone. And the years I squandered of loose living, it's all on me. The time that it took me to repent is on me. Not because God wasn't willing, not because people didn't pray. Flip a little further to chapter 15. Jeremiah 15 verses 1 through 2. Then the Lord said to me, Even though Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, my heart would not be with this people. Send them away from my presence and let them go. And it shall be that when they say to you, Where should we go? Then you are to tell them, Thus says the Lord, Those destined for death to death, and those destined for the sword to the sword, and those destined for famine to famine, and those destined for captivity to captivity. The Lord's response is the same for all who practice iniquity. Depart from me. And the people ask, where should we go? Death. You know the way. Keep following your sin been leading you there all along even after God tells them their unrepentant heart continues in sin God's will is he's going to destroy the wicked that's, that's his decretive will as much as the sun runs its course and the moon and stars shine at night you remember when Abraham interceded for Lot and he said, Lord, will you destroy the city if there's 50 righteous, 20, 10? And the Lord wouldn't destroy the city if there were righteous in the city. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. God saved the righteous 
And when there were no righteous in the city, God judged the city. God's will be done. That, that's God's will, whether I pray or not, whether I have family in the city or not. At some point, the reality is, I might not be praying in accordance with God's will. And the effectiveness of my prayers are limited by the sinful conduct of the individual I'm praying for. Now take note. The Apostle John doesn't say, don't pray. I think that would have resulted in a lot of sin for mothers with wayward sons. They can't help themselves. So John doesn't do that. He, do, he doesn't prohibit prayer. He simply says, I don't say that you should pray. He's not encouraging prayer for that person like he does the, the sinning brother who keeps with repentance. Rather, it's okay to assess the situation and realize, God, I know you've done all, all that you've done. You will do all that you will do to bring this person whom I love, whom you love, to repentance. Romans 2.4 says that the kindness of God leads to repentance. God, I know it's not an issue of your kindness. I'm going to trust in your faithfulness and your kindness. And John says, it's okay to put the mantle down. That at the feet of Jesus, after you've done all you can, all you're responsible to do, you've witnessed to them, you've prayed for them, you can have clean hands. That it's not an issue of prayer. It's not an issue of our intercession for that person. It's not an issue of the Lord's willingness or ability to save. We all have to make our own decision to repent of our sins. 1 Corinthians 7 warns against the dangers of a believer marrying a non-believer. And it's dangerous because we can think, oh, they'll get saved. They'll, they'll come around eventually. And verse 16 says, For how do you know, a wife, whether your husband will be saved? Or how do you know, a husband, whether you will save your wife? We don't know if the person we're praying for will ever repent. The reality is, they might never make that decision. We know they have the truth because we've gave it to them. They have the willingness, patience, and kindness of God. What request is there to make? They have all that they need. And John says, don't feel guilty about putting the mantle down, just laying them at the feet of Jesus. You can have clean hands. Or you can pray. But don't forget to pray for the brother who's actually in the fight. That, that will probably be a time better spent. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. Did any of you think that one verse wasn't going to be enough? It's a heavy verse. It's a good verse. We got it for a reason, amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for that one verse. Thank you for all the verses, Lord, for every word that you've spoken, that you've breathed out. We love it. We love everything you say. It's hard to receive sometimes but we know that it's good for us. There's vitality in your words, that there's life. Father, I lift up all your children in this room today and that you just pour out your grace and mercy on their lives. All the concerns that we have for our loved ones that this verse would, would apply to, that we would be able to Grasp the reality of the situation with grace. 
and to maintain the joy of our salvation, Lord. Thank you for keeping our countenance up. Lord, for, for leading us to life in Jesus, picking us up when we stumble. Thank you for, for keeping us on the path, Lord. Please keep us on the path. We love you. We treasure you above all else. We exalt your name. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen.